<laughs> Via telephone, the House Majority Leader, Eric Householder, who I've seen almost every day for the last <laughs> week. Eric, Eric, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing this morning? How much copper piping you got on you today there, Eric? Oh, my. Thank, thankfully, that's all done. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm getting ready to crawl in an attic. Well, here's my week. I've got an attic. And then the crawl space. So I've got to be in both uh, both extremes today. But uh, well, so Matt, don't discount now Alex Mooney. I think that's that, your that's your winner for that U.S. Senate race. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why I said if if that <laughs> is the race, they're already uh, pulling the gloves off. But I was thinking that's the right. exact that's same right. thing, Eric. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. And Eric, I was thinking at least I didn't ask you to go into a crawl space or an attic when you're out. <laughs> oh, I know. I tell you, my knees just can't take it. My mind tells me. Well, I feel like uh, you know I'm 20 years old still I, you know my body acts like i want to be 20 years old but my mind reminds me yeah, yeah and now you're you're 50 soon to be 55 so. how, how much drywall did you have to rip up in rob's basement that's <laughs> uh four little openings oh okay to, so not bad <laughs> no not bad just eric you know the through. Oh. You know, the greatest cause of injury among men our age, and I'll be 55 this year also, <laughs> is thinking we are still younger men. I know, I know. I mean, I just feel like I could still do what I used to do, but nope, my body and my, you know, just reminds me, nope, you're not that spring chicken that you used to be. Well, so. while all of you are auditioning for the next Geritol commercial, remember that product? From <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to our subject matter for the day today, because I'm the oldest person in the room, and I'm not complaining about my age here at all. I'm the only one out there. You uh, come to grips with I'm, it. I'm, I'm sadly resigned, so yeah. I'm still younger than Stubblefield, so that's all that matters. <laughs> By a couple of years. General revenue sure. collections for the month of April totaled $825,930,673. The monthly estimate was $506,901,000, which leaves a monthly surplus of $319,029,29,673. And that takes the year-to-date surplus to $1.585 billion, Eric Householder. Yes, it does. And you just took everything away from me. So it was great talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get yeah. back to the HVAC discussion we were having. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the state's finances are firing on all cylinders. We're bringing in, we're, we're reaching that potential that, that most of us had mentioned, uh, you know, several times on the station that we could see $1.8 billion surplus. We're completely in the realm of possibility if we have $150 million for the month of March or May and $150 million for the month of June. So uh, we're on target to reach that $1.8 billion surplus. So, Where did most of this revenue come from? Well, personal income tax, it exceeded estimates by roughly $193 million. Consumer sales tax exceeded monthly estimates by $19 million. And our severance tax exceeded estimates by $18 million. And corporate net income tax, right around $65 million. That's what makes up that $319 million that you just mentioned, uh, that where we exceeded our our monthly estimates for the month month of uh, April. So, yes, now of that one point. $5 $5 billion surplus with the potential to have $1.8 billion. If you remember, we've already spent $1.1 billion in the back of the budget in the general revenue surplus section. So we would have about $700 million remaining uh, for whatever uh, potential spending priorities that the legislature or the governor's office would have. So there you go. Matt Miller. I, I hear you mention uh, the majority of it coming in the personal income tax. Uh, the, the population in the state is is not growing. Um, we hear a lot about it going down. So is it more people in the workforce or better wages that are helping to lead to more in that personal income tax? Well, and a combination of uh, other factors as well. Uh, keep in mind, when there's high inflation, the state will generally do better because the state government always does better when there's higher inflation. Your sales tax numbers are going to increase. Your, your gasoline taxes are going to increase. People are back to work. We do have lower unemployment right now. But for the month of April, that's tax collection. So most of our, the, the revenue is coming in from people owing uh, personal income tax. But uh, for the most part, Matt, everything's been uh, firing pretty well. And uh, like I said, we're on target to see that $1.8 billion, maybe even $2 billion surplus. Very possible. 
So what is it like when you have to deal with that? Because I can imagine it's it's a curse on both ends, right? If you don't have enough money to make ends meet, that's a very difficult challenge. But when you are having surpluses like this state has had over the last several years, and this one could be even bigger, and you've got more and more people saying, hey, give us some of our tax money back, and, and public right. employees saying, give us more salaries, uh, it, it's a hard problem, but one I'm sure is better to deal with than the other end. Well, and here's where you got to be careful. Now, once again, if we end up with seven hundred, eight hundred million dollars left in spending priorities, you uh, you know you have a decision to make. Obviously, you could use one-time spending, or do you want to use base building? Base building would be additional salaries, like we you know with correctional officers, or or I mean, we just came off of uh, this past session doing a pay raise for all state workers and teachers. So, you know, we've we We've been very fortunate doing a 5% pay raise the last four years. So uh, for the most part, I think what you're going to see is maybe some one-time spending parties, maybe uh, laying, laying some more asphalt down throughout the state, you know, fixing some more secondary roads with uh, uh, road maintenance. So, you know, I'm just speculating, you know, $700, $800 million. There's tons of spending priorities that I'm sure that the governor's office in the legislature will probably come up with here in the next couple of months. Hey, I got a question about spending. We had a doctor on earlier who was talking about a lot of West Virginians being dropped off uh, dropped off Medicaid. How do you feel about people on Medicaid who are capable of working having to work to keep their Medicaid? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I've been saying for the last several years that we need to reverse this trend. You know, we're becoming a bigger and bigger welfare state in the state of West Virginia. We're you know, one third of our recipients are on some type of transfer payment, and uh, we need to reverse that trend. Um, in fact, you know, I did introduce a bill this year. Uh, if we're speaking about able body adults, yes, uh, able body adults, if they're available to work, they should be working instead of draining the, the system for these needy services that so many of our needy individuals that do need that can't work for whatever reason. But uh, no, we do need to reverse that trend. One hundred percent. I I agree yeah. with you. I mean, yeah. it's a society. I mean, we need to take care of the the sick, the old, the children. Always, always. I mean, that's who we that's are right. as West Virginians. But when that's we take right. care of the lazy on the backs of the the hardworking taxpayers, that's unjust, and something has to be done about that. It, it's been a challenge. I mean, we have had made some uh, uh, inroads. Uh, keep in mind the. The the uh, the bill that we did pass, I think it was about three or four years ago, uh, that required able-bodied adults to go to work. The Biden administration, when they came in, they issued an executive order. So there's been a stay on that right now, um, but um, we'll see. Uh, 2024 is coming fast approaching, and hopefully we'll have a new president that can uh, turn this economy around and get us back on the right track. Let's hope. Hey, Eric, yep. let me ask you on this uh, on the surplus. What do you think is the biggest? I mean, you, you talked a little bit about infrastructure and roads and stuff like that. What is another big thing that you think we need to do with some of this surplus to make West Virginia better? Well, if we're going to be careful, obviously we do need to tackle the correctional issue problem that we're having with uh, pay. Now, I've said before, and I've had a sidebar conversation with Rob about this, you know, we, we have our neighbors to the uh, north and east of us in Hagerstown, uh, they're paying their correctional workers three and four times more than what we're paying our workers, but they're still also having uh, worker shortages. So I don't know that money is the key. It's just obviously it's it's a uh, a field of uh, of work that sometimes people do not want to work in. And you know why do you want to go to work and be hollered at and spit at every day? And that's that's the life of a correctional worker. But uh, and, and a talk show host. <laughs> yeah, the doctor, yes. There you go. Hey, and a politician. There and you a go. politician. <laughs> a lot of us have been there. Yeah. But uh, I mean, most of us would agree that a thirty-three, thirty-four thousand dollars salary for a correctional officer is way too low. And uh, so I think you're going to see some some effort to try to get them uh, to try to get those salaries up a little bit to at least make it somewhat com comparable. Uh, but most of us have, you know, we're also advocating for uh, locality pay. I think this is a perfect opportunity for us in the Eastern Panhandle to keep beating that drum that, hey, look, 
you know, of, of the five uh, correctional facilities, four of which are in the eastern Panhandle and Potomac Highlands. You, you, so you've got at least three in the eastern Panhandle that desperately need more money and one out in Augusta. Um, so, you know, you have at least four of these facilities throughout the eastern Panhandle and Potomac Highlands where we do need uh, locality pay, uh, no questions they ask. And I think it's a perfect opportunity for us to maybe even – you know, continue to talk about it and to get somewhere with that. So we'll see. Eric, I know you have to get going, uh, so I won't keep you uh, any longer here. But uh, just to be real clear, at the end of the $1.585 billion we are in excess, yes. how much of that has to be committed to the state income tax cut uh, that uh, will be for the entire year of July well, 1 beginning? Yeah, well, well, it went retroactive this year, January 1, so it's about $163 million. And then the following years thereafter, it's about two hundred and sixty million every there every year thereafter, if we meet the ten percent threshold. Remember, we can reduce taxes up to ten percent each year. So so one year I mean next year you may only be doing a four percent income tax cut. But it does look like there will be an income tax cut next year now because of these numbers yeah. this year? All right. Yes. Yeah, so you're going to need at least 260 million. But the most you can do is 10 percent each year, correct? It, that's right. That's the most that you can do now. And, and keep in mind, in the back of the budget of that 1.1 million, we also set aside 400 million uh, in case something were to go awry. So we already have money in the bank per se to cover if we're going to have a 10 percent income tax cut for next year. So there you go. Excellent. Thank you kindly. Appreciate yep. your time, sir. Yep. We'll see you guys. Enjoy your day. Take you care. Too. House Majority Leader, Delegate Eric Householder there. And uh, formerly Finance Chair, too.